Hi, I'm Femi OK. At the end of every stream episode, I chat to the guests off the air. Those relaxed conversations are very different to the live show. Welcome to the bonus edition of The Stream, a collection of candid discussions that have never aired on TV until now. Coming up, the impact of kidnapping for ransom attacks in Nigeria and in the UK, the impact of disruptive climate activists intent on forcing their government to take the climate crisis seriously. But first, Afghanistan and the return of the Taliban rule. Guests shared their recent experiences of interacting with the Taliban. Journalist Ali Latifi now feels self-conscious wearing Western clothing. Nadima, who also lives in Kabul, had questions about this. Take a look. Ali, when did so, a Taliban tell you you can wear a T-shirt? Because I'm seeing on the street people dressing normal and people are... This was... Men uh, are... This was... Well, that's the thing. This was, this was last week, and it goes back to, to Charlotte's conversation where she said, you know... Your higher up said, as long as I wear a scarf, I'm okay. And then, you know, some of the people she interviewed wouldn't talk to her. Uh, it was the same, it was similar to me in that uh, I, I went to a friend's house in the very beginning and some of these Taliban leaders were there and he made a joke in Pashto. He's like, oh, look at Ali, he never dresses this way. And this very high, high ranking Talib figure was like, oh, he can dress however he wants. He doesn't have to worry. Um, and it was interesting because that day I had passed so many, you know. They, they were as like the way Charlotte described it, right? They were driving in their in their Rangers and in the Humvees, and they passed me and didn't say anything. And it was a group of three. Two of them just walked off, didn't say anything. One of them came up to. It was really weird. Um, so that that I think that's what we're saying is that it's not always. I think it's difficult because the higher ups have one image, and then I think mm -hmm. it's the same thing with police, right? Like like. You're, you're always going to have unruly people that don't necessarily follow along. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, just the fear is that if those unruly people get too unruly, you know? What I'm hearing are there are rules, but everybody's not too sure what the rules are. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's trauma. Well, what it is, it's trauma. It's trauma, a lot of trauma, a lot of past. That's why I... I'm not bothered by anything because the past has nothing to do with me. I'm here wearing my turban, going to weddings, going out, speaking. Well, I'm not going out and speaking to kid, all these guys on the street. That's not who I want to work with. That's not who I want to negotiate with for the future of Afghanistan. But I personally have not received any threats, any calls, any, any kind of issues. As a matter of fact, I'm going to post next week to create a beautiful gathering of people, as I always do. I come with you. And so for me, it's just strange that people are bringing, I understand people have trauma, but I feel like we continue to talk about the trauma over and over again. And again, we're going back to the, the clothes as opposed to really focusing on the real issues, which is saving lives and, and finding ways on how we can move forward and, and bring the bridges together, the government uh, was not, none of them were angels, if I speak in the most <laughs> simple language. They were full of dirt, and these guys messed up. They were full of dirt, and now they have the opportunity to come together, and nor, nor is North America all ho holy. They created more damage than anyone in the history in Afghanistan. So there is damage everywhere, but now we have the opportunity to correct that and, and our generation, we have the responsibility to present ideas, set strong boundaries. And, and you all know that this is, is it's, I'm still, it's like a big chess being played, you know? Checkmate, you know? Team has moved. This, uh, I think we all, as our generation, we have responsibility to give the truth and speak from within and speak for the humanity. I sincerely don't care about the Taliban or Americans or any government. I care about humanity. We have responsibility to the people. And let's focus on them. Let's find solutions for all. Like I said earlier, these people, nobody's asking me, okay, Nadima, you're there. What do you need? How many widows are on the street? How many kids are in that park? How many families are displaced? Everybody's curious about knowing about politics that I sincerely, they're not going to pay the Nadima, bills. Nadima, actually, on, yes. U on YouTube, let's, let's bring up the YouTube right now. 
Sylvester asks, what does Afghanistan need before winter comes? What are your long-term goals? Sylvester wants to know, what, what do you need? Not what trauma is going on, but what do you need? What, what do you need? What do you think one person needs, you know? Mm -hmm. in, in the winter, when somebody's living in a hut, it's going to get very cold here. We need clothes. We need shelter. <laughs> we need fire. They, they, we need heat. We need simple, basic things that we need to focus on. And who is going to bring that support? I'm still stuck on the people that died the other day at the airport. I want answer for those. Yeah. Is that going to be just put under the rug and forgotten? Are we still going to talk about how Taliban's are? I feel like the subject of Taliban and women is used to distract from what's really going on in the country. And I'm sick and tired of it. I don't want to talk about people telling me, or any journalist, how do you feel about wearing a burqa? I don't care. I want to save lives. I didn't stay behind to fight and protest about what I'm going to wear. I'm here to make sure that these women are left, not left abandoned again. Charlie, this conversation is so educational in so many ways. There are, there's the nitty gritty of a transition um, for Afghanistan. And then there are the, the real hearts and minds of Afghans that are really important. How do you want us to end this conversation, Charlotte? Where do you want to take us? Um, I mean, you asked earlier about what's going wrong, um, are, are there misconceptions in the media? And, and I mean, Nadima's biggest uh, frustration is the fact that conversation's about clothing and not people. My biggest frustration personally, seeing I'm in the media, is the narrative. I'm constantly asked, um, are you silenced? You must be silenced. They must, she's only saying that because she's scared. Um, mm -hmm. The narrative of kind of Western savior complex, we have to save people um, and this mm -hmm. hysteria that goes with it. It's, it's, you have to listen to the people, not mm -hmm. I'm in the West, I think you need this. And in the last 20 years, all I've seen of the Taliban is terrorists, they're not people. Listen to people, mm -hmm. hear from Afghans themselves, hear their narrative on both sides, be open-minded to the fact that they're all humans, they've all come from different traumas and backgrounds and histories um, and been born into this and lived a really, really hard life for two decades. And if, mm -hmm. and if any progress is gonna be made, we have to think of everyone as individuals um, and try to find common ground. Al Jazeera's Charlotte Bellis, Ali Latifi, a freelance journalist struggling with his clothing choices every morning in Kabul, and social media influencer Nadima, the only person that I've ever heard called the Taliban little boys. Thanks for being on the stream. I know that you will remember the Chibok girls, the Nigerian school children kidnapped from their boarding school in the middle of the night by the armed group Boko Haram. That was in 2014. Now, kidnappings have become commonplace in northwestern Nigeria, where criminal gangs have found holding people for ransom is an easy source of money. There's a state of insecurity in the country. Stream Guess explained exactly what that means on the ground. Yeah, I mean, uh, insecurity in practical terms uh, in Nigeria means uh, living in constant fear because you are not sure you wouldn't be attacked if you went out to shop or to school or, or to work or just anywhere. I remember when Boko Haram was uh, on rampage, uh, rampage in the northwest and the northeast, there were times I would just go out to home not, not being sure I would be back home. And that's uh, what happens every day. I remember this particular day when there was an explosion just outside my office. And I was checking when I came out and had to, uh, I mean, wiggle my way through the the, the bodies of uh, people who uh, died, including the bomber, before I could get out with my car. And so it is very real. It is real human beings being affected, uh, being uprooted from their homes and from their livelihoods, uh, hoods, which are their farms, but also from their schools, markets, and everything, and being sent into cities as beggars. And even the cities are not, uh, I mean, very secure. Malsi, insecurity in the context of Nigeria, paint us a picture. 
It's, it's a constant state of feeling unprotected. Um, unprotected from um, people you do not know their intentions. Um, you know, it's, it's a constant lack of trust, a lack of trust in the people around you, lack of trust in the ability and the capacity of the authorities to respond when you're faced with a situation where you cannot help yourself. And so it's constantly, I mean, I live here in Abuja, the, the, the threat of Boko Haram, Matato, even um, these bandits um, moving into Abuja any moment is real. It's, we live with it every day. Um, um, I've traveled to many parts of the Northeast, the Northwest, um, especially the Northeast in the, in the, in the height of the Boko Haram um, conflict. And, you know, the, 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 the sense that people wake up, like Bulama said, wake up every day, you know, unsure whether they were going to last the day. And if a loved one left the home, on the uncertainty whether they were ever going to return, and living with trauma, the trauma of abuses and the trauma of the fear that the abuses would not only come close to home, that you could be the next victim. And it's just that sense that there is no one looking out for you. There is no one that has the capacity to respond to the threat that you face in a way that would, you know, assure you that even if the worst did happen, there would be a response and there would be consequences um, for the perpetrators. And Jamie. Thank you. I mean, I'm not quite sure how else to, to say it beyond what Mousy said. Really, the fact that no one is looking out for you, and if anything happens, you're in a sense on your own, and being in a in a constant state of just not knowing. Um, my organization tracks missing people in Nigeria because Nigeria does not have a missing persons database as a country. So there is no central database where people can track, like, can report a missing loved one or find out what's happening. So if you use that as a as a sort of a a, a, a symptom of, of maybe not symptom but as an example of how that problem is so in a nation where you can't report that my loved one is missing that means if anything happens to you you don't if you once you step out of your house or even in your house you know that if anything happens to you there's really no mechanism that can be set in motion that your life is valued and valuable that someone will do something about it I want to show you all a, a picture. It's a picture that we've been using to talk about this show. It's, it's on my laptop right here. And you see two family members being reunited. You feel that pain. I'm, I want to cry just looking at that picture. I cannot imagine what both those family members went through. Is Nigeria's kidnapping crisis out of control? I think that picture says a lot. But I just want to get a very brief answer from all of you. Is there a solution? Can Nigeria, Nigeria handle this particular crisis on top of many others? I want an instant answer from each of you. Balama, go ahead. Yes, I think Nigeria can, can, can confront this problem successfully if we accept the gravity of the problem. The government is still treating these people as petty criminals when, when in reality they should be treated, treated as terrorists. And they, there should be an anti-terrorism operation in the Northwest. And to do that, you need to, uh, I mean, develop some transnational strategy with Niger Republic, because we know that these bandits are now operating transnationally. Calling them bandit, of course, in the beginning was, I mean, their local name, and that's what they are still called local. And what bandit uh, should uh, shouldn't mid 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 mm -hmm mislead us. Okay. Now, the final point I want to make, I mean, which I couldn't make uh, there was that what I had Yemi say in the beginning, and I can be wrong, and I hope I am wrong, was that the Nigerian security forces are complicit in this. And that, I, in my opinion, is conspiratorial. There is no evidence to support that. And that is disrespecting the sacrifice the boots on the ground are making. Soldiers and police officers are killed every single day. And if you tell me politicians in Abuja are complicit or are negligent, I, I won't quibble with that. Even when you say military leadership in Abuja de doesn't take this matter seriously, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. But the Nigerian security forces, the police officers, the ordinary soldiers are given everything they can give. It right. is for politicians to support them. 
and for Nigerians to support them and to acknowledge their sacrifice. I acknowledge the difference of opinion between you, Balama, and Yemi. Yemi, is this, and I, want, I need this to be brief because I'm wrapping this up, is this kidnapping for ransom issue, crisis that Nigeria has, can it be solved? Yes, it can. And I think to say that the Nigerian security forces is complicit doesn't mean that they're not people on the ground who are sacrificing their lives. The Nigerian government is irresponsible, but are there government workers who are doing their jobs daily and serving their country? Most definitely. But when we speak generally about the Nigerian government, I will say that they've been irresponsible and um, in, in their handling of matters. So it can be solved, one, if the Nigerian government, as someone has said, takes it seriously, as it should. When we had COVID-19, there was a daily briefing because it was considered a crisis. It was considered important. I'm not quite sure why we haven't seen this kidnapping of the insecurity in the country at that level where we're not getting daily briefings and seeing, and I think as Bulama mentioned as well, the different security agencies working together. So there's a part of government in showing leadership that Nigerian lives are valued and they take this seriously, but also on the part of citizens, the things that we must do in holding the people that we've elected accountable and putting due pressure on them that they must do the job in which they've been elected to do in as well as working within our communities to protect ourselves. Finally, Mousy. Yeah, I totally agree with um, the other speakers. Um, it's definitely um, something that can still be controlled if there is honesty on the part of the government. Um, you know, as Bulama said, I am not exactly sure that we have proof that there is complicity, but there's so many levels where government has been dishonest. I mean, just that speech from the, the Minister of Information is just, is just really jarring um, because they have intelligence reports. They know the gravity of the situation and trying to deny it or pull the wool over people's eyes is not helpful because guess what? Security agencies cannot on their own without the support of the people, the cooperation of the people. And when they continue to make statements like this and the response is so ineffective, they alienate the people. They reinforce the sense that there is this wide gap between the rulers and the people. They need the people. And you, unless we come together and realize that there needs to be a, a convergence of ideas, you know, community people know a lot more about their community than anyone else. No security forces from Abuja or maybe Goso to any other part of Zam Zamfara State is going to be able to solve this. You need the people to work with you to cooperate with you, and it has to come from them believing that the government has their back, that the government will protect them. We know of so many cases of informants being, you know, given up to, 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 to the criminals and then turned, or turned, turned upon by the criminals in retaliation. And so in, it, the government needs to know that it needs the people to work with the people closely in devising solutions. I'm a bit, you know, afraid when I hear, you know, like the, the kind of comments that Bolama made about naming this um, terrorism. What we're going to see from the history of the Nigerian security forces, when you have, you know, you give them all of the powers, they're going to go in there, kill civilians in the name of fighting terrorism, and honestly, very few of the perpetra real perpetrators are going to be were brought to book. And, you know, wherever they find them, they will execute them. We're going to see, you know, an increase in human rights abuses. Unfortunately, that's the history of the Nigerian security forces, and we cannot ignore it. And so we just must be honest with ourselves that, they, you know, we, we can't find a solution. The problem is deep. The problem is complex. We don't expect them to find solutions on their own because they, do, they cannot have all of the answers. They must understand that the people um, have contributions to make and their right to participate in decision making and in re reaching uh, uh, policy uh, decisions is absolutely key to finding a, a, a solution to this problem. Mousy Shegan, Africa Director for Human Rights Watch, Balami Bukati from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, and Yemi Adamalekun, Executive Director of Enough is Enough. Finally, to London, where the climate justice group Extinction Rebellion has been using disruptive protests to draw attention to our climate crisis. Scenes like this one on Tower Bridge are extraordinary and an example of what Extinction Rebellion activists have been able to do. I asked our guests to share their most impressive stories of mass civil disobedience. Well, I'd love to briefly tell the story of the, the Five Bridges protest in autumn 2018. 
which was the second, I would say, mass nonviolent direct action by Extinction Rebellion. I was there, I was part of it, I was on um, Southwark Bridge that day, and many of us were uh, uncertain what was going to happen. Uh, at the appointed time, we were all kind of standing by the side of the road, and we were like, how do we do this? And a lot of people were quite scared. And then the moment came, and a few of us just stepped into the road uh, when the lights changed and said, come on, everybody, and everybody stepped into the road. And we're like, oh, my God, it's as easy as that. And just like that, we occupied the, the bridge and shut it down for the next uh, several hours, uh, despite police efforts to, to clear it. And it's an incredibly empowering thing when you realize that actually when you have a righteous cause, sometimes you don't have to obey the law anymore. Aaron. <laughs> sure. I think for me, one of the most striking uh, actions that Extinction Rebellion have done is to uh, shut down the printing presses for um, the Sun and the Daily Telegraph, and they kind of closed them down for a whole day. Um, and what that was about was about what Rupert was talking about in the show, about the fact that these papers are actually daily putting out lies and misleading information uh, about the climate crisis. They've, for years, put climate denial, denial into, the, into the public conversation, and they're still doing it, right? And I, what the protesters were trying to do is draw attention to that and say, why aren't we having this proper conversation about what the science is telling us? Why isn't every day the front page uh, about the climate disasters that are happening or the lack of government action? And, and they were trying to uh, draw attention to that really effectively. And I think they kind of proved their point because what we saw afterwards was just so many articles in these same papers attacking the protesters um, and what they stood for, um, almost demonizing them really, and uh, defending the powerful moneyed interest of the fossil fuel industries that they, that they were being criticized for. And so it kind of really, I think, proved what the protesters were saying. And, and you know, the label of being called an extremist uh, for the protesters is something that has kind of been forced on them uh, by the media. And we really have to kind of be on, on our guard to that. Jenny, most impressive mass civil disobedience. <laughs> I don't know if the, if the uh, example I'm going to give you is the most impressive. I think it was probably the most fun. Um, and that's important about Extinction Rebellion. We are not grumpy. We are a fun organization with a serious purpose. Um, at the October Rebellion in, 19, in 2019, uh, the grandparents got together opposite the gates of Buckingham Palace, and we sang songs, and um, we had marvelous art, which we always have. Uh, the artists of, of, of XR are a brilliant crowd. Uh, and as we were being law-abiding elders, um, suddenly the, the call rang out, there are people locked to the palace gates. So at that point, we separated in, and, and there had, were a number of grandparents who had locked themselves onto the palace gates. Um, this was actually funny, um, because there were many police there, as there always are, and somehow or other, um, the grandparents singing in a very peaceful way um, had distracted from um, this furtive action. And uh, I think that it was, uh, was life-affirming that, uh, that the, the older crowd is still there to be counted. Uh, and um, ha has uh, a few moves of their own. Not everyone agrees with the tactics of Extinction Rebellion, and some of the criticism of the group has come from the UK media. After the show, Aaron and Rupert shared their experience of appearing on the stream. Aaron tweeted, I just joined a fantastic conversation with Femi OK on climate action. Such an important discussion. I wish the media had more coverage like this. There's no public conversation that is more crucial. And then Rupert posted, this program on Extinction Rebellion is so different from the usual media fare. It was in depth and there were no lies, misrepresentations or attacks. Refreshing. Thank you for the reviews, gents. If you want to see the entire program about the tactics of Extinction Rebellion, go to stream.aljazeera.com. And that's our show for today. I will leave you with scenes from the Impossible Rebellion protests in London. Thanks for watching.